Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, where inspired women talk about the journey of motherhood through the common thread of parenting, relationship, and sexuality as a path to consciousness. We ask, in what ways can we show up more fully, live more meaningfully, parent more wholly, and love more unconditionally? How can we mine the wisdom from the experiences of our lives and expand into those challenges. If you are here, you care about paving a path of conscious and intentional motherhood, connected with yourself and your gifts, and also illuminating your children in theirs, so we may raise more whole humans who can impact this world in a more humane way. And if you feel like giving a little back to this free content, please become a patron of the show and receive extra member benefits for less than a coffee a month. Or you can leave a review on iTunes and Facebook, all of which helps the podcast keep going and reach more mummers who need this type of tonic for the soul. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash NTM podcast to find out more. We are Julie Tenner and Bridget Wood, and we are so grateful you're here. Hey, everyone. So great to be in this group. There's so much amazing stuff happening. Yeah, you guys. This is going to be a problem because we're not together. This is, you know, part of how we're rolling today because, as you all know, we're all doing kids and family and showing up for work and making that beautiful mix something that's dynamic and doable rather than something that's separate and untangible. So we're Mm. doing this from separate places where we both have kids in care for, you know, half an hour. Bridget, your kids are with your mum? They are. And And Joy is Yeah, hubby. So if I do my lives at this time, he's on his work break, he has lunch, and this is how we make it roll. So it's about Mm. doing everything and. So I just thought, Bridgie, I'd start with, oh, maybe we should say who we are first, and then I just wanted to read the About the Mad Women, because I just thought it's so freaking beautiful, and then from that place we could riff from there and Mm. see what fits in where, because certainly finding the function in perhaps what you might perceive as dysfunction now is really the conversation that we want to have because that makes a difference. It makes Mm -hmm. a difference to your life. It makes a difference to how you function. It makes a difference to your experience of love and the flow of connection between you and your kids or you and your partner or you and life. So that's where we want to take the conversation today. Maybe we'll just riff on who we are and how we got here. Go on, Bridgie, you go. So we began Nourishing Your Mother five years ago now and it really came from a place of us having these really um, pretty profound conversations and, re- and recognising that we put a lens on things that, that we felt many people didn't and that, that we wanted to have a conversation about more widely. So our podcast um, has now had over half a million downloads and we have audiences all around the world and have now taken well over a thousand women through um, our programs and our coaching and Julie and I also have our own businesses that feed into Nourishing the Mother and which um, brings a unique lens um, through which we discuss all of the concepts of conscious parenting and relationship through. So my background is um, I trained as a journalist in, and in media and I worked in corporate communications for over 10 years and then found that motherhood kind of blew me open um, in a really good way and in a really messy way and in a really profound way which really led me on a path of, of conscious growth and unpacking my place in the world and, and really getting solid on the kind of mother that I wanted to be in the way in which I wanted to raise my children, which was a little bit at odds, I think, with some of the mainstream attitudes to children. Um, and that's become the, the focus point, a lot of our conversations around that um, and around families and the function of families. Um, has really been what Julie and I have done for the last five years um, and really about how we amplify the woman in motherhood and how we see motherhood as not this this kind of um, place that you escape to and are not seen by the world, but in fact a place where it it can be your greatest growth and a place where you can really find yourself and, um, and rise rather than hide. So that's me, Julie. 
Bridgie, I just want to say, that was beautiful. I do that every day of the week. <laughs> body magnificent. I loved it. I loved it. I always find this a bit awkward. Who are you? You just like super nailed it. For me, I'm always like, oh, who am I? <laughs> As you're saying that, I did. I did think I've left out one of my. You know, I've left out one of my businesses, but it's because it's like COVID totally like annihilated it. So. No, but you should totally say that here because your business, watching you. Do that alongside nourishing, nourishing the mother for the last five years has been actually a profound and inspiring experience for me. So, as you know, as we've had children, like through the podcast, we've had what three children over three the children. Years. <laughs> yeah. And so, through all of that, there's this beautiful weaving of the call to go inwards and the call of motherhood, mm. and then business and woman in the world and it's like this beautiful kind of I always think of it like the infinity symbol it's kind of just this continuous movement isn't it and Mm -hmm. we've largely also we're almost as part of being a universe you and I kind of do that dance on equilibrating Mm -hmm. spectrums of the infinity symbol I think that's how I look at it so I've watched you do really profound things and it has always been a source of inspiration and when I had no idea what my form of art was going to be in the world and I was questioning that I would watch you and go oh I want that for me too I like it's just a beautiful experience I Mm. love the idea of of which is so what the mad women is about is women raising women rather than I'm jealous and that's a bad thing it's to go she's my muse and inspiration Mm. and Mm. I get to breathe that in and celebrate and love her up and go and I'm going to breathe in some of her energy and empower that for me. Like, I think that's a beautiful experience. So please share, please do what you've been doing. Uh, so for the last five years, also alongside Nourishing the Mother, I um, have been running events. So um, really conscious living based events where we would um, elevate consciousness through the through film and conversation, taking topics across a broad range of um, subject areas like wellness, education, um, I'm trying to think about all of the other ones. There's a host of personal growth, spirituality, a host of, of topics and really pulling in experts in different areas and creating um, community around these things that often the mainstream puts no lens on or judges very often. Um, one of the speakers who you'll actually see on my website homepage is Pete Edmonds, who is actually being um, taken through the ringer by the mainstream media like nothing else right now. And uh, you know, with a background in journalism and a, a very keen eye for um, human behaviour and understanding narratives, I find it and critical thinking and critical thinking. Um, I find it extremely interesting that we and, and important that we create spaces to discuss things that that are not um, always given voice and are not always given the appropriate lens and critical thought around. And so I've hosted over 70 events over the last five years in Melbourne, Geelong and um, in in Byron Bay and all around, you know, amplifying the message of certain documentary films and giving people a forum in which to discuss and dissect ideas and choose their own way Um, and also working with local businesses to um, bring local businesses as part of that community hub so that people who are wanting to perhaps explore wellness or explore you know, educational streams and mm-hmm. actually partnering with businesses who provide services in line with that. So really a kind of quite a holistic experience of going and finding your peace um, in a place and feeling really inspired by it. So um, that's obviously an event focus, which has been annihilated by COVID. So mm-hmm. the chances are that we won't actually have any this year um, looking at the current restrictions. So that's that's been a and, and I would invite you to think about when Julie's touching on um this this infinity symbol and, and the and family dynamics and expansion and contraction is that I noticed that three years ago when I was really expanding my business, Julie was in this holding pattern of not knowing what she was doing in her business. And now I'm now we're in reverse roles and Julie's expanded her business and I'm in this holding pattern of not knowing what I'm doing and in fact that's actually not dysfunctional it's actually highly functional for a a system so Julie and I are almost in an intimate system as business partners and in a family you're also in an intimate system where your roles are going to shift and change and and that to to, when we apply the lens of asking ourselves how this is functional we can move with more empowerment um, forward as opposed to feeling 
you know, like a victim or feeling, you know, or descending into feelings of shame or, you know, whatever you can attach to where you find yourself. So we'll move on to that discussion after Julie's had a chance to tell us her story. <laughs> I was just going to go, go, Bridge, go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, Julie, tell us. Mm, mm. All right. So um, I'm Julie. One half of Nourishing the Mother. I met Bridget after the birth of my third child and we were in a natural parenting play group. So by virtue of loving the things that you love, you end up in the places where people love the same things that you love. Mm -hmm. And so you have this beautiful meeting and merging of values that raise everybody's vibration and you get to deeply immerse in that. So for me, that was a natural parenting play group. So my third, my eldest is 14 now. And I have four children, so my youngest is two. So I met Bridget after the birth of my third and um, I went, I need a hub of conscious parents because my older two had already moved into the school area. We started at Sina, ended up in mainstream. And so my network had significantly changed and the lens with which I saw <sighs> development and the influence of motherhood and what I knew I needed to immerse myself in yet again to be able to parent this soul with the depth that I wanted to parent her with required a space where I could tap into that energy with a group of women. So I found my local natural parenting play group and in walks Bridget on the first day I arrived and I was like, oh, I am meant to be here. <laughs> so that's how we met. And then we were having the most extraordinary conversations and we were mad gunning podcast addicts. Mm. Like you and I, we were like, like we're all over it. Six, ago, six, years, six or seven years ago now, podcasts were like not even a thing really in Australia. So there, was only a, there was only a handful of Australian podcasts yeah. then. Exactly, yeah. And so back then we were always like oh, podcasting because we both had a thirst for learning. And so to all of a sudden have this platform on which you could access the most incredible minds on any topic that lit your little soul on fire, you could do. On a, it blew my mind that this was mm. what was now possible in the world and had never been for my first two or when so I'm trained as a naturopath as I started naturopathy. You're like, none of this existed. So mm. I was blowing my absolute socks off. And so we used to have these conversations about, oh my gosh, the most amazing thing, did you listen to this podcast? And we text each other a podcast, it was like a book group. We'd have a podcast group where we disseminate the learnings of a podcast. And then at some point, um, Bridget Cairo was running the wellness couch and he was like, Bridget, you should just come on. And Bridget rang me and I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> like, yes, you can if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that's honestly how we started. We started because we found in each other the most extraordinary, lit up, soulful conversations that we had nowhere else in the world to access and certainly nowhere locally. Like we can love all of our friends and our family, but the depth and the level of conversation and growth that we were seeking, we couldn't find in those spaces. So all of a sudden mm -hmm. we found each other and we thought, there's got to be other women like us <laughs> yeah. who want to have the conversations that we're having. And that was what fueled us to start it. We didn't even start with any any business structure whatsoever. We were just two women, super passionate about consciousness, soulfulness, and the meeting place of parenting within that. And that that was the lens with which we applied the overlay to motherhood. Mm. And we both had different experience, but that always led us to the same thread of to nourish the mother is to nourish the entire unit. Mm. So we knew that we, when we um, minimize ourself in service of another, that that was a belief and there were old wounds that were holding us back. And so when we delved mm. into those, all of a sudden we found an infinite source of energy and capacity in motherhood that wasn't available to us, you know, five minutes before asking the, you know, better quality questions to get the better quality mm. answers and experience of life. Anyway, so that's how Nourishing the Mother started. And it wasn't until we were about a year into the podcast that we were like, oh, there's like a whole group of women who want to have these conversations. Now we should get together in a group. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. That's what we started doing. And so we've just slowly had these building of gatherings 
for just the richest conversations with the greatest level of depth and vulnerability and story sharing, which I think is al- always, story is medicine for the soul. And when mm-hmm. we hear a story with the outer ear, we also hear it with the inner ear. And as I say in Women's Circle all the time, everyone's a mirror. Like this is the universal law, right, Bridget? Like mm-hmm. the one is the all. And any one experience is also the experience of the all. And when you can hear your experience ripple, perhaps in a different form, but there's a vibration that hits that place within you, it's absolute medicine. Mm-hmm. So that's the lens with which we created Nourishing Your Mother. So in the background of that, I grew up with a yogi. So I grew up with a very um, spiritual lens on life and embodiment and breath. And by the time I was 15, I was very much immersed in women's work and then trained to be a naturopath, got into deeper women's work, trained to be a doula and did birth work with women for about seven years, did paediatric work in naturopathy. And then sort of this art form, most of my clients ended up being um, forms of counselling and in-depth women's opening. And I was found my energy and my life and my space there. And so Women's Circle became a space of medicine for me. And the evolutions of all of that has moved through, you know, four children, really. And with each child opens a new gateway to what's possible. And it was through meeting Carly that I really, she went, can you please stop hiding? She didn't say it exactly like that, but pretty much. Mm -hmm. Can you please just show that to me? And I was like, oh, no, I can't. I can't do it. You know, and she was Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you can. And so it was through this beautiful, you know, wind under my wings with someone who saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself that I really let the world see the way that I see it through conscious parenting and conscious relationship and intimacy and so that's how I structure the pleasure nutritionist is that pleasure is the missing ingredient from spiritual practices from relationship from parenting Mm. from food from exercise from every facet of any woman's life I've ever worked with So I run deeply immersive women's experiences. I know that my soul's gift is to open doors for women so that they can swing them wide. And I focus very much on the intimacy of self-relationship and then the play out and and the mix of that in um, family. So I don't think you have to parent consciously and lose deep, rich intimacy. So mm. that's the lens I bring because I think it, I don't know of another um, spiritualist, yogic, tantric teacher in embodiment and sexuality work who also has four children. <laughs> mm. So I think it's just a really beautiful meeting place for what that looks like mm. in amongst family as opposed to separating these two experiences. Mm. So that's, nice. that's such a gift too because in doing that and in, in being the invitation to mix sensuality and sexuality with the intensity of mothering four children, you are building bridges that have been burned down for centuries mm. through the church and through, you know, so many systems Everything. that want to segregate, right? And so that's a, it's a rebellious, it's an act of rebellion and also an act of inspiration for anybody who, you know, is touched by that. So I love it. Thank you. So I thought we could, I could read this mad woman. I don't know if you've read the about or not, but I think it's delicious. So I thought it's worth reading. So the mad women, the make a difference women, the ones hell bent on leaving the world better than they found it. Something special is happening. A showcase. Come and see them shining. Let them inspire you. Let them show you what's possible for you. Let them see their fire, love them through their nerves and their humanness. I'm so honoured to be standing alongside every one of these women as they unleash their magic in the world. Mm. How delicious is that? So gorgeous. So the women who make a difference, the ones hell-bent on leaving the world better than they found it. I just thought that's the place to have the conversation Mm -hmm. around Mm -hmm. the function in the dysfunction because when you can start to see that the entire universe is orchestrated for your growth, not in the way of your growth, your children and your relationship and all the clunky pieces are included in that, it becomes a very different lens and a space of empowering self as opposed to 
you've done this to me, the world is like this mm. to me, and all of a sudden you move from I'm a victim to da-da-da to oh, I have mastery here. And I just think mm. that is like pff, talk about making a difference in lives of women and world and parenting. Yeah, so much, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so much, yes. So I think one of the great ways um, in which we view conscious parenting particularly is that it is an intimate dynamic with your child. Your child is never separate from you. So whatever you are witnessing in them is an expression of an interplay between the both of you. So one thing that Julie and I love to do is to bust the, the common labels that can be applied to behaviour or to people in a family unit um, because our children are never just a label or they're never just one thing, just like we're never just one thing, right? Like we're never just kind or we're never just cruel or, you know, we're, we're never like extroverted all of the time. We're, we're nuanced and we're, and we're, you know, whole and we're multifaceted and so are our children. However, what often happens is as parents, we will um, disown feelings within ourselves or we'll try to like amplify parts of ourselves that we like and push away the parts of ourselves we don't like. And the more that we have that kind of separation within ourselves, we will actually tend to see in our child the very thing that we find most difficult within ourselves. And the reason why is because our children are very, very... Um, Actually, they're the tasked with the role of helping the family move forward. The task with the role of helping parents evolve and in, in evolution looks like owning the pieces of ourselves that we cast aside and that we make wrong and that we judge. And so the more as parents we repress certain things, the more our children's behaviour can come, become more erratic or they'll be more persistent in a particular kind of behaviour, almost as if to push a button for you, um, you know, to get so deep under your Skin that, that you face the thing that they're trying to bring up for you and if we're unconscious of that we make it all about the child and we want to fix the child and we want to be away from the child because we don't like how it feels for us to be around that child but in fact they're simply setting us up to feel what it is that it feels like to be them and also mm -hmm. to feel the parts of ourselves that we don't want to make okay so that we can grow so they're actually bringing, out, bringing to us pieces of ourselves that we don't want to feel, that we've judged as wrong, that we've disowned for the purposes of us to grow, which is a pretty big difference from a mainstream lens on how we look at a child, right? Mm -hmm. A child as someone's behaviour to manage or to curtail or to you know, stop or, or um, label as wrong. The child really can't be looked at separate from the family dynamic and particularly the parents because... Mm -hmm. They are part of a whole. Mm. Are you asking me? Mm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I need it for you to, for you to yeah. amplify your aspect. I'm sorry. I'm distracted because I'm going, I think our lives appearing in the group, but I can't see it in there. Are ah. you able to say? We want to make sure we're live, that's for sure. Let me just have well, a look. It says, it says live on my Zoom. But then I went into the group and I'm well, like, because maybe I can see if there's any. There might be some comments that we're missing as well. Oh yeah. Well yeah, go. I wanted. There we are. Oh, there's I'll some can... comments as well. That's oh, good. you can see <laughs> us. Oh, thank goodness, I because I was scrolling her. through, going, I can't see us. And <laughs> sorry, you can pick up on my energy because I'm going. I hope we're in here, <laughs> or if we're not, I'm thinking we're on Facebook, are we? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. The humanness. Okay, so you can see so comments. I can't. So are you? I can see comments. To... So why don't I just go back to some of the comments? So if thank you. Um... That would be super. Now my mind can rest. Thank you. Yeah, good. Now we can come back to what we were talking about, right? Sorry. I can see you kind of. I can see you. I know because I'm going. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Um, Sammy said, I love that motherhood really birthed you as well as your child. Oh, my God, yes. And, you know, this is something that we're really passionate about too is that um, our culture doesn't really celebrate that. And, and like, I make a point whenever I see someone say, oh, happy first birthday, you know, to your child. And I'm thinking, happy birthing day to you, right? Yeah, like, because this 100%. is – and, like, my third's about to turn one and I am, like, I'm feeling all of the feelings this week because – one Just as much as she's about to turn one, I'm having, I'm coming to the conclusion of of, mm. of that, you know, really pivotal postpartum period. Mm. And every baby you have, you meet more of that, more stretching. And and so we're really, really big on on putting that lens just as much on the child as on yourself and who you're being asked to um, 
evolve into because the thing with children is that you know the the I love this quote from Carl Jung who said um, you know the greatest um, disservice to a child is the unlived life of the mother right like because the children want to see your blueprint like they want to see you shine in the world so that they can see what that could be like for them right Mm. and and that to us too is that is that motivation and inspiration for us to continue to push past the parts of ourselves that want to close and the parts of ourselves that you know at 10 o'clock on a you know monday night when we don't want a podcast that we still are because we're Mm. still showing up we've been showing up for 52 weeks a year for five years I know. It's actually amazing. It's actually amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I remind myself that all the time. It's like, look what you've done. You know, like whenever there's the hard thing, look what you've done. Mm. Because it's so easy to focus on what you haven't done. It's so easy to look for your gaps and where you're not, where you're not enough, right? (laughs) Um, Linda says, love the music celebration, not competition. Yeah, but it's also a practice, right? Because we're so socialized, mm. and you know, and, and our animal mm. cells love a competition, right? Like, there's parts of us that thrive on that. Um, but if we get too focused on competition, we actually look too much at the person next to us and not about what's trying to birth within ourselves, right? Mm. Um, thank you, Katie, for witnessing the gift that it is. Lovely, Katie Parker. Mm. Linda says exactly. Parenting is a real life experience of yoga. More testing than sitting in. Meditation in the cave, absolutely. Julie, you love to talk about that. Can you can you just yeah, give us your little spiel on that? Because I think it's great. <laughs> I hope I can remember it and download it in this moment. I mm. just there's part of me that dies a little when the spiritualist conversations that are around are so embracing and encompassing of shadow and challenge. So when you're on the yoga mat and you're striking a pose and it starts to get painful or your muscles start to burn. And your monkey mind starts to go, you could just come out of this. You could just escape. You could just Mm. blah, blah, blah. That the yogic practice is always to melt the pain through your body, to find the space beyond the pain, to make this part of your practice as opposed to in the way of your practice. Same thing with meditation, right? Like no one probably says that better than Joe Dispenza in that in meditation Mm. you will always meet yourself. And then we all go, yes, we always meet ourselves. So every resistance and roadblock that I feel in the space of meditation is me. So I can breathe in that challenge and I can find my way through it. I can transcendental my way through it or I can breathe my way through it or I can yoga my way through it. And then all of a sudden when it comes to parenting and we're like, oh, no, you're just a bad kid. (laughs) And I'm like, what the Mm. fuck? Because as soon as your eye bridge would say to someone, okay, but how is this challenge you? How is this your disowned path? How is this pain the practice for you to breathe in and disseminate and melt and move through and have it be your practice? How is this the meeting of you that leads you to somewhere greater? And that becomes a difficult conversation in motherhood because we have a far stronger cultural narrative around it being hard and I need to escape and get away and these kids are so blah, 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 Mm -hmm. blah, Mm -hmm. as opposed to they're me. And every time I resist them, I'm resisting and separating me. Mm -hmm. And every time I move towards them, I'm incorporating more of my wholeness and doing the very growth that I say that I want on the yoga mat. And then it appears in the universe through the most perfection in all of our disowned parts are represented in our children, right? Whatever we Mm. repress, they express. And so the universe offers us this beautiful opportunity to master our own growth. And then we go, oh, no, that doesn't apply here. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm always like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> because yoga is life intimacy mm-hmm. is the yoga of the heart so I don't think that they're separate practices I just think we've separated them and it's become so socially acceptable to separate them as well yeah. right like it's just and and the thing is unless you put yourself in a place where that that social construct is going to be challenged then you'll continue to live in an unconscious way because of the lens you never put on it right but we're really passionate about our children um, being celebrated for their wholeness, which means for us, right. 
like, you know, like for instance, my middle child probably feels, feels like she challenges me the most at the moment. And that's for me, right? It's not for, and, and the point at which I want to be away from her is the point at which I'm not wanting to feel what comes up in me being around her. So her loudness or her demandingness or, you know, all these pieces of her that I'm finding, like, you know, are a rub, which on any other day might not be so challenging. But because of what I'm transitioning through, those feelings that she brings up are more amplified for me, not to me, for me. And I choose to meet them. And, you know, the reality is not about parent shaming either because we've, we've all got our different values in the way in which we live our life. But, you know, Julie and I seek, seek to see great wisdom in what comes up for us in our children for us to understand. And also what comes up in our intimate relationships, you know, the points at which they close, at the point at which we close. And that how are we up until this point using that functionally, even if we want, might want to label aspects of our family as dysfunctional? Because actually, if we're using them and we're getting benefits from it, and that dynamic is somehow serving us, then then maybe we don't want to change it. Maybe it's actually really functional for where we find ourselves until we want to change it. In which case, we have the power to, and we ask ourselves really great questions about how we're showing up in our family, how we're recognizing each other, how we're appreciating each other, how we're seeing the divine order, how we're noticing, mm. you know, that when that when our partner is, you know, a big one for you and I years ago was, you know, that the, when we were um, learning with Alison Armstrong, who Carly recently mm. interviewed, we interviewed her on the podcast about three years ago, and we noticed, oh, this, tough, this, this whole testosterone thing and the fact that, like, you know, men have been out all day and at night they kind of want to just, like, rest. And, you know, Julie and I would be like, but that's our, like, that's our go time. Like, what do you mean you want to rest? And, you know, we'd shove all these labels and our husbands are lazy until we realised it's deeply purposeful. And mm. to the degree to which our partners could rest was the degree to which we could rise because even in a family dynamic, you're having a conservation of energy all of the time as well. And so... Just like if you're going to have a two really high-powered parents, you're likely going to have a child who you would label as lazy or a child who you might label as not driven because a family is like a whole universe and you're going to have to have all roles balancing. It's mm -hmm. very rare that you see a family where every single person is on and rising and kicking goals all of the time because that's not actually representative of, of natural laws. Natural laws are always, you know, seeking their opposites and growing through opposites, just like a family does. Mm. Yeah. I love it. I always think what's the, you know, um, how conscious is conscious parenting? Because I think that's become a very popular label, certainly in the mm. last uh, probably three years, I think. Yeah, it has. But how it's conscious... I was going to say, it's probably since Dr. Shafali really came on the scene and, like, you know, had yeah. a lot of power. It's been, it's been, it's come more into the, the, the um, mainstream consciousness a lot more. Yeah. But mm. how conscious can we say conscious parenting is if we stop at the you? Mm. If all we're doing is trying to change our child or do things to our child, you've missed the universe in action and you've missed the consciousness. Because if all it is is you, you've lost and missed the whole point that this is set up for the me. Mm. Like the divine orchestration is so perfect that in each and every moment, everyone involved in that dynamic is getting exactly what they need. And I often think I work a lot with women and anger and often these women will have one child who's excessively agitated and um, angry and uh, aggressive, but they are women who cannot tolerate their own anger and aggression and seek to be smoothed down and calmed and, um, you know, perfectly peaceful women and mothers and or they have a wounding story of trauma that makes anger and its expressions really unsafe mm. and then they have, they birth this repression of their disowned part, they birth the aggression and I think how beautiful is this because in every way that you're shoving it away, they're bringing it out. And so this brings back an enormous amount of power because forget even doing anything to you. We can talk about conscious parenting tools and tactics till the cows come home. But if you've <laughs> missed the fact that this is the expression of your repression, it mm. won't change. It's mm. here for your growth. The moment you go, I'll take more of that space, 
in the whole universe that is our family, I'll take more of that space. It's no longer a space available to them and the behavior disappears. So true. And only- I can give you I can give you a beautiful example of this for so last night, um, my husband and I were both super tired and just feeling kind of like, you know, our, our, our nerves felt a bit fried and our two older kids were just like, you know, nothing could bring them down. They were just super high energy. And I said to my husband, you know that they're like that because we're like this. Like, you know that, right? And he's like, yeah, I get it. Like, because this is the thing, the more amplified, the more high energy they were, they were simply counterbalancing us because we were, our nerves were kind of fried a bit and we just wanted to veg out. We didn't want to... Um, meet that with meet that energy that they were bringing us and we were the counterbalancing opposite of their energy so it's never that our kids are like so annoying or too loud or they're simply just expressing our repressed parts in those moments and so at that point when we have that awareness we have a choice and so what I did was chose to direct their energy in a way that felt good to me and that was connecting so I could connect with them in a place of playfulness that wasn't giving up you know my need for kind of I didn't really want to amp it up too much but I could still meet what they were needing and allow the energy to change because as soon as I can take up some of that space and take up some of that energy they're not needing to anymore and you can bring connection back and you have this kind of meet point again of cohesiveness within the family before obviously all of the little kind of and if you imagine those little atoms kind of flick out again and reorganize themselves, but you've had that connection point within the family that keeps coming back to, I know we're a whole unit here affecting each other all of the time. Yeah. I just wanted to share that because as we were talking about it, I thought, yeah, it's a perfect example so of, perfect. of that. It's so mm-hmm. perfect. But then I also think instead of, you know, particularly if we take anger examples or high energy examples, is what a gift that is as opposed to the child mm-hmm. who's in your way. That child is doing everything for you that you're not doing for yourself. And I think how mm. fucking beautiful is that? Like we, if we don't take a moment to just appreciate the levity and the gravity and the love mm. that's involved in that, I think it's, it's a tragedy. Yeah. I'm going to read some of the comments and questions. Mm-hmm. So um, Tegan says, I celebrate the mother and father on the kid's birthday. Tough fire we've all come. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm. That's so beautiful. Sammy says, like, God, I can't listen to you two without crying. <laughs> that's so, that's so sweet. Um, I think, I the, I think that's when you know right place, right time, right? When the soul yeah. opens. Mm. Um, Sammy says, how do you take that deep understanding and apply it to the day-to-day? When I listen to you both, I feel the truth in my bones, but then I turn around and yell at my kids for yelling or fighting or whatever is irritating me. Yeah, that's the practice though, right? Mm. Like, I, I just always think of it as that's the practice because like we practice, you know, if you're a yogi and you have a yoga practice that you do every single day, you do a yoga practice every single day because it keeps you li- limber. It, what's the word? Limber? No. What's the word for malleable? It's left my head. Anyway, it keeps you flexible yeah. and <laughs> alive in your body. I've heard some words have left my brain. If you don't practice your yoga for three years, you're not going to be able to do what you were Mm. able to do when you practice it every single day. Mm. And a yogi who practices every single day doesn't think, at some point, I will reach the black belt of mastery and will no longer have to practice. The person who's reached the black belt of mastery in, you know, karate or yoga both know that there is so much that they don't know. And so the practice continues Mm. their learning and their growth. So, I always think of this as not an end result or an end goal. There's not a point at which you master it. There's not a point at which the challenge disappears because we're designed to experience challenge so that we grow those parts of us. We will never have this point where life is peaceful, when children Mm. are perfect, or you know, when the children leave home, then I'll not have to be here anymore because the challenge will then appear in whatever area of life you're valuing career, relationship, who knows? The challenge of the universe is constructed, and Bridget, you talk about this in terms of support and challenge, there has to be an equilibrium of both. We generally, mm-hmm. when we're comfortable and we're feeling pretty good, we're not really changing. Mm-hmm. Most of our revelations are born out of deep pain. So we have this experience of pain, and I always think it's kind of like the universe with this big arrow, like going, this, here. Work mm. on this. And then I kind of go, oh, thank you. 
all right, I'll mm. do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the form the form of which it appears is irrelevant. It could be through my husband, it could be through my kids, mm. through my work, it could be through my friends. The form is completely irrelevant mm. because I see it all as the universe going this. And then I go, okay, all right. <laughs> you know, so, I'll meet you there. Yeah, so I just feel like that is the practice. Mm. So the places at which it gets challenging and sticky for you, I kind of look at my children going, ah, oh, okay, here, thank you. And then I come mm. back to the self and the practice. You've got to be able to have a practice that you continue to return to so that when you hit the fight of your life in that day, when you enter the, you know, the gym or the, I always think of it like a boxing match whenever it's, you know, um, one of my kids is having something that's bringing stuff up in me. I kind of visualize that I put a um, boxing ring around myself and I think, ah, this is, this is my, this is my time. This is what I've been practicing for. This is the fight of my life. And then, you know, I float like a butterfly and sting like a bee and I'm going to use all my tools here because I've been practicing for so long that now it's here and I get to really do it like for real mm. as opposed to like it's feeling pretty comfy out here like for real and that's orchestrated for my growth so I know that that doesn't directly answer your question but I just want to change the lens of focus to my kids are and I've lost blah 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 to mm. life is the practice this is a practice this is not I get it right or I get it wrong I've mm. succeeded or I've failed this is practice all right that fight mm. I got knocked out in this one I totally championed I wonder what happened there what was it that I can continue to I'm going to take some of that and I'm going to recognize next time there's a left hook here I'm going to move this way instead it's a practice it's not a point at which you go Got it. Don't need to practice anymore. Mm. <laughs> like Bridgie and I, I know you do, I know I do, practice continuously all day, every day. Mm. We practice through breath. We practice through presence. We practice through self-pleasure of whatever form that looks mm. like in this moment. We practice through embodiment. We practice through opening and recognizing our closure and opening again. Mm. We practice through stretching our nervous systems when our kids get a little crazy. It's all practice mm. that's designed for your growth and mastery. And whatever seems in the way or challenging right now is exactly your perfect practice, is exactly the place that you need to grow through to have everything that you're wanting to put out in an affirmation in the world. The minute you put out an affirmation to the universe, it's going to go, cool but you have to be the person for whom that's the reality so here you go get rid of this mm -hmm. and so I always think of that I go okay yeah so I've asked for bigger mastery um I don't know greater wealth more purpose deeper peace in my relationship I don't know whatever your thing is that you've wanted to affirm or chase um or put on your vision board this year yeah so the person you are now has the reality that you have now the person for whom that change is a reality has a different way of seeing the world and showing up within it. So in order to become that person, you have to enter the ring. Mm. You know? Mm. Is there anything you want to yeah, add to that? I just, I'm thinking back to what you were saying about that spiritual practice. It's like, you know, I often think about that, that saying, um, what do you do before enlightenment? You chop wood. And what do you do after enlightenment? You chop wood. Like, <laughs> you continue to <laughs> yeah. chop wood. Right, and the thing is, every new age and stage of our children will bring up new edges, and yeah. so the more that you're practicing yeah. with, like, what comes up in yourself, the more you're like, oh, I'm a bit like snarky with that thing that they're doing. What what's there for me? Or yeah. oh, I was pretty short tempered there. Like what's going on? Like what do I need right now? How am I viewing this situation? What am I not willing to feel within myself? As opposed to reaction, reaction all of the time, you know, because our kids are too much, which is in fact we've, we've missed that point of our own boundary and our own um, relationship with ourself, which we've neglected and it's flicking out in all of these myriad ways around us. Because the relationship to self is the number one relationship that you must care for in order to be caring in the relationships around you as well. 
Because if you don't look after yourself and have a connection point with yourself and have a place where you honour your own boundaries or at least know what it looks like when you overstep your own boundaries, then everything's everybody else's fault. But it's only everybody else's fault because you haven't listened to yourself. Because mm. blame is the most easiest thing to do. Zero responsibility, everyone else's problem. But mm. the self-responsibility and the relationship to ourselves has to be number one. And this is not about going to have your half an hour self-care somewhere. This is a constant practice mm. and um, willingness to value yourself all of the time. Like, and, and sometimes telling yourself will look like deeply challenging yourself and that is still loving yourself, right? Mm. Mm. Which is what oh, man, 100%. About. Because loving yourself doesn't, doesn't often, I think, even look like something that's beautiful. It looks like wading through the darkness. Mm-hmm. And we are so comfortable with chasing the light and so uncomfortable with our own darkness. Mm. But you can only be half of you if you're rejecting half of you. Mm. You know? Mm. So uh, there's two questions that I love for you. When I was listening to you do a live in Queen's School this morning with me, there was the question that you said, which I think you just said then, which was, um, oh, God, why, essentially, why this? Why this? Why is this here? for me and the second question that I love that I add on to that in every moment so I think it's always wise when we see something playing out continuously with our kids is to take the observer lens so like in yoga where we love to you know be the observer or in meditation be the observer don't be in the experience Mm. is to ask why this why this what is this here for for me and the second question to that would be why now? And I think those two questions alone will make the most enormous difference mm. to you as a woman, lover, and mother. So true. Why this why now? Go. Like that. Go. You go. I'm going to take us through a few more of our questions. Yeah, Linda says, that's me. I first aggression and it's teaching me every day. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's intense. Um, Sammy says, yes, I feel so much shame for my anger and how I express it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and this is the other thing. If we keep feeling the shame for it, then we're actually never going to move beyond it because we'll keep, it's almost like a, um, a neural pathway. It's like you've got that, um, that that road like kind of in your brain there and that until you can stretch outside that road and start to see the pattern that's, that's laid it down, it, it keeps pulling you back in as a cycle. So we do a little bit of work and, in fact, it, I think I'm not sure if you're in sort of a motherhood, but we've got a um, workshop this week on 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 processing shame and guilt, which would be really helpful for you if you're in there. Um, Linda says I'd love to know a reference point for that, so I can learn more. I'm not quite sure what reference point for what. Well, can you tell us? Because um, we've we've been spoken a lot, so I'm not quite sure what that was, what that was in reference to. It happened. Thing. We talked too fast. Yes. <laughs> Lana says I love that meeting their energy and taking up that space. I can relate to this. Yeah. Um, Tegan, of course, while this is wisdom. Oh, thanks, Tegan. Charlie, Lit and Limba. Does that mean anything to you, Julie? What was that? I didn't hear that. Lit, lit and Limba. Lit and Limba. Lit and limba. Oh, for my yoga, I was like, what? Limba. It was Limba. And then oh. in my head, I'm going, is that the word? <laughs> <laughs> lit and Limba. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Lana says, they are there for you. I love looking at it like that. Another way of being so grateful for the gift of bringing a child into the world. Sometimes we think we should be grateful because others can't have children, especially during frustrating times. But to then amplify that to say that they are there for you is beautiful. Yeah, so sometimes I think that this can be a really common thing is that I shouldn't feel this, this towards my child because I should be grateful that I just even have a child. But what that does is it, it doesn't actually take you to the point at which of ownership or the point of which of truly meeting the thing that's coming up for you because it's kind of a the disconnect. It's, it's a almost, I shouldn't feel this because of the starving children in Africa, or I shouldn't feel this because other people are more hard done by. But it's, it's not actually giving you a chance to sink into the potential ownership and and transformation that's available when you look at that for from the lens of what's this here for for me. Mm. Would you uh, Would you agree, Julie? Yeah, I would. I can um, care, says, Bridget Wood. I can care. <laughs> Linda says, I love that too, and I'm conscious enough to see that I'm in a place to practice my skills. Yeah. Uh, Alicia, Alicia says, um, 
replying to Sammy, yeah, the shame around um, losing it. The breath and the pause before reacting is my mantra and we do the best we can. Yeah, and I think also relationships also grow and honestly through repair. And there is yeah. so much beauty when we can, you know, and I do this to my seven-year-old sometimes um, or even if, you know, like my three-year-old sometimes will say to me, you hurt my feelings. And I'm, and I'm like right there with her going, ouch. Yeah, that hurt. Like, because I want her to be able to express that in relationship. It's important for her to feel safe enough to express when another person hurts her. And so I need to support that rather than descend into my own shame and not want to face it. Mm. Yeah, sometimes I might say things that will feel hurtful. And and to navigate relationship is to, is to not try to hide that and not try to, like, shove that down or, or make her somehow feel responsible for for my reactions, you know? And similarly with my seven-year-old, being able to repair, being able to say, wow, did you notice how like I was behaving like this and then I felt when I did that, like, I was super angry, you know, and that then gives him a blueprint to own his behavior, which is essentially, you know, better than many adults can do, right? Like we're, we're building relationships, we're building, you know, skills here. It's emotional Sammy intelligence. Says, That's it, mm. exactly. Sammy says, oh, my God, this is speaking so clearly to me. Thank you. Yes, I need to grow because I have new goals and dreams now. Yeah, and also when we set new goals and dreams and when we set big stretches for who we are, we're going to have that, like, you know, almost like that tussle, like a caterpillar inside the chrysalis who's trying to break free. And so you're going to hit every kind of edge and wall as you're trying to tussle mm-hmm. through that, and, and that's part of that birthing process. And I always yeah. love that um, Winnie the Pooh quote, which, you know, is essentially – to become the butterfly, you have to give up being the caterpillar. Mm. So many of us want to cling on to being the caterpillar, but we still want to become the butterfly. Let's stay the caterpillar. We want to, be, we want to become the butterfly without without the the, the uncomfortable yeah. transition, right? Kind of like birth, like you know, there's, there's purpose in that deep dark descent. There's purpose in being in that place of not knowing and being in in totally handing it over to powers beyond you to to you know kind of transmute the stage of pre-baby to having a baby in your arms and 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 trusting that you know that's it's deeply vulnerable but that's where the power is i think in, in allowing um sammy says i definitely need to get the soldier in motherhood yes yeah, so we should start to talk about ways in which people can work with us julie yeah because we've, we've been talking we've before it happens we go far too long what are we at nearly an hour here <laughs> <laughs> I kind of kept going. This is what happens. This is why we have a podcast where we talk for hours. (laughs) (laughs) So to connect with both of us is through Nourishing the Mother podcast, which you can just download and just by searching on your podcast app, whatever it is, whatever smart device you have, just hop on your free podcast app and search in Nourishing the Mother and you'll see our profile picture pop up there and you'll be able to subscribe and then automatically, it's like magic, they just download and you can listen to it like you would on, um, you know, listen to music on your device. So it's Mm. literally like that. And then beyond the podcast, we have a conscious motherhood membership group called Soul Driven Motherhood. So it is for women who are soul-driven, wanting to have next-level conversations about how to move through the challenges and awaken themselves through motherhood. So that can be found through our website, nourishingthemother.com.au or Nourishing the Mother on Instagram or Facebook as well. Mm-hmm. And we have three courses that we have as Dr. Sandy, you can download or get through a mastery pass that we've just released at the moment. So we have aligned, sorry, soul-driven parenting, which is all about parenting with your alignment and all of our skill set we walk you through every module essentially Mm -hmm. of what we feel it is and what the tools are to use to parents with a level of consciousness and soul then we have um, sugar and spice which is our conscious sexuality awakening course and then we have loathing to loving l2l which is our universal principles and concepts for really soul and self self growth and personal development so you can have a look at all of those. Again, mm. same socials, same website. Or have a look at the Mastery Pass we've just released and you can have access to all of them for six months. So, and to connect with you, Bridget. It's suburbansandcastles.com and you, Julie? Is thepleasurenutritionist.com. I feel like we just need to do our wrap-up on our podcast. Yeah, I know. I feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> can, we do, can we do it again? How do we connect with you, Bridget? suburbansandcastles.com and you, Julie? 
thepleasurenutritionist.com. Remember to nourish the woman to rock the family. (laughs) And we'll see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. Thank you so much for having us, gorgeous Carly. Thank you so much for tuning in and using your very precious listening time to be here with us. We really do hope that you have a mad experience from this, which is just making a difference to your life or yourself or your parenting, and that you do come and connect with us in deeper ways. That would be really beautiful. And if you want to support Nourishing the Mother and all the late nights, the early mornings, the blood, sweat and tears we pour into our art, then please go to patreon.com forward slash NTM podcast and become our patron. As a patron, you're helping all of the cost of operating this podcast, the hosting, the editing, the transcription, helping all of that be completely covered and joining a community who are all about honoring our journeys and continuing to open. The more support we have, the longer we can last. So become a patron. We'd love to have you. Go to patreon.com forward slash NTM podcast. We literally couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much for listening and please share this podcast with anyone you think it would be medicine for. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst The Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of The Wellness Couch podcasts.